John chapter 3. We thank those who have worked in the service and those who will yet work. And we hope that there is a blessing in the word of God for you on today. In 1 John chapter 3. 1 John is toward the end of the Bible. 1 John chapter 3. Look, if you will, verse number 11, 1 John 3 and verse 11. The Bible says, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. I need to make sure that's not just in my Bible. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Message for this morning, a loving church in an unloving world, a loving church in an unloving world. Based on the coronavirus, the medical community has declared us to be in a pandemic. But I would suggest that our pandemic is not so much about the virus as it is the hatred amongst men. It seems that every day we are discovering more means by which people are polarized. There are those who are in favor of masks, there are those who are in favor of what they call their liberty. There are disagreements about vaccinations. Should we be vaccinated or not? Politically, we see hostility between Democrats and Republicans. In the church and in various experiences of life, there are those who are comfortable with doing things with technology and are happy with online. And then there are others who argue that we must be in person. As we consider all of the dangers to humanity, some have suggested that the greatest threat to us is our annihilation because of weapons of warfare. Some have said the greatest danger to man is global warming and the ill effects of climate change. Some are concerned about national security and the threat of terrorism. But the hostility of one man against another man poses a greater threat to the survival of the human race than any other looming dangers. A person who can hate another, a person who has the capacity to hate, with that hatred, that person also has the capacity to destroy another. In the sacred scriptures, we are told that God is love. And we, his church, his children, we must carry that love wherever we go. In our churches, in our homes, on our jobs, in our schools. Wheresoever we should step, our mission must be to demonstrate the power of love. And if we are to transform the hearts of sinful people, 
We are to redeem the souls of men and women. We must show a hateful world our loving God. Love is the greatest need of the day. It is imperative that God's people show and demonstrate love for one another. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Certainly in our churches there are a lot of priorities that we might give to any number of issues in the scripture. We may discuss our theological positions and practices. There is certainly a scriptural way to worship, a way in which our worship can be acceptable to God. We can discuss our views on instrumental music. We can discuss our theological positions on what we call the preacher. We can have discussion about end time prophecy and we can talk about sin and justification from sin. We can talk about the frequency of the Lord's Supper. There are certainly many topics that we could discuss. But in all of our discussion, we must not be negligent to give high priority to the subject of love. Because without love, everything else is null and void. Without love, everything else is irrelevant. Without love, we cannot coexist. Without love, we are in danger of extinction without love. We will never know the true measure of God's character as we discuss that God is love. We can never know the character of God's love without practicing that love and seeing how transforming love is. It seems that more and more people are finding a means to disagree with one another. We're finding a means to take sides and to be at issue with one another. And we draw the line on superficial issues. We draw the line and we are an expert in our own opinion. We are an expert in our perspective. But as opposed to advancing our agenda, our greatest need is not to convince someone that my ideology is right, the greatest need we have is that I need to convince you that I love you and that I can accept you even if we disagree. The concept of love is not merely a thing. It is an action in which we must be engaged in the ministry of loving one another. When Christian love is put into action, it is awesome. It is powerful. And love can change, love can transform heart and hearts. But we have to recognize that love is not an experience that one sees on television. Love is not simply some feeling that one has that causes them to feel soft on the inside because of euphoric thoughts and sensual pleasure. Love is a ministry. And when people talk about ministry, all of us have been gifted in different ways. All of us have been blessed by God to offer something different. I believe that God has given me the gift of preaching. And I certainly know God has not given me the gift of singing. There are, within the body of Christ, different ministry gifts that all of us have. But the one ministry that is the common denominator, the one ministry that we must all see the value in is the ministry of loving each other. We can never tire of love. We can never exhaust ourselves in demonstrating love. And while we look at all of the discord and all of the problems in the world, and we wonder what the government is going to do to deal with political infighting. We wonder what 
or the Fed chairpersons and of the committee that works to determine things in our economy, what are they going to do to stabilize interest rates? And we wonder, will the housing crises ever come back around? Will chips be made available for cars? We, we are trying to determine what everybody else needs to do, not seeing that the church has a ministry of love. And I just believe that God has allowed this interruption in human affairs because he's trying to get not so much the world's attention. He's trying to get the church's attention. Amen. How does the ministry of love get exercised? First of all, love is a ministry that seeks the best interests of another. When we talk about loving people, it's not how much attention they can give me. It's how much attention I can give them. It's not how many of my preferences can be met, but how can I look to them and seek their best interests? Because love is a labor, it's a work, it's an effort. And when we talk about loving each other, we have to look at love as a means of submitting to one another. Because the Bible tells us to submit to one another in love. But when we look at the word submit, it is a word with a very interesting and simple but profound meaning. The word submit in the Bible means to fall under another. It means to come under someone else. And when we look at why that's significant, it's because all of us are bearing the loads of life. All of us have weights that we're dealing with. And sometimes we are broken because of the load that we carry. But if we see what love is all about, where I come under you as a support to you, the purpose of me coming under you is so that I can help you with what's over you. If I can come under you, it's like a table. The, the reason the value of the legs on the table is because what's under the table is designed to support what's put on the table. When we look at the legs, the legs are not always seen. The table gets to show its beauty. You might have a wood table that has been carefully designed and crafted. You might have a wood table that has some designs in it and, and it might be shellacked and, and sanded and, and someone has allowed that wood table to show its beauty. And we don't see that with all of the beauty of that wood table that the value of that wood table would be irrelevant if it were not for the legs that are not seen. When we talk about seeking to submit to one another. I don't have to be seen to help you shine. I'm glad you can shine. I, and, and I'm happy when I see that you've been sanded and shellacked. And, and, and I don't need to take credit. I, I'm just happy to be a leg in your life and, and help you to bear the burdens of life, to help you to carry the weight of life. See, one of the problems that people have is that they will help somebody to shine, but then they want all the credit in the world. I can tell you that in my life, I have had some shining moments, and it is rather strange to me that when you shine, how many people get upset with you because you're not giving them credit for helping you to shine. helping they, they feel like, well, I helped you. And you got folk that always want to remind you of what they've done. I remember calling my mother a few years ago. I was written up in some newspapers and was traveling the country speaking at universities and doing some things that were a blessing in the ministry and shining in some ways. And, and I discovered that 
I had a whole lot of folk that took credit. And, and somebody that babysat me one night 40 years ago would holler about I helped raise him and all that kind of nonsense. And listen, if, 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 if you really want to help somebody, you do it. And you're not looking for any credit. You do it because it's the right thing to do. You do it because you're loving somebody and you're trying to support someone. When we see the value in loving one another and supporting one another and seeking one another, this is about expressing our genuine concern for people. See, one of the problems that we have today is people are selfish. And people are looking out for themselves. But real love is sacrificial in nature. Real love is not determining what I can get and how I can benefit. Real love says I'm going to do what's right because my love for you compels me. And if you never say thank you, if you never express appreciation, if you never honor me, if you never give me a trophy, an award, or an accolade for loving you, that is all right because my blessing will come from God. See, too many people are looking for their blessings for doing right to come from people. And our blessing for doing right will come from the Lord. Listen, the Bible says you reap what you sow. But I need you to understand what the Bible does not say. The Bible does not say you reap where you sow. The Bible says you reap what you sow, but it does not say you reap where you sow. In other words, God will make sure you get what you're supposed to get, but you can't be worried about where you're getting it from. You ought to just be happy that you're getting it. See, sometimes God will bless us and we so upset that the blessing didn't come from where we want it to come from. And we are so busy turning a, a blind eye to folk who love us and who are good to us. And we get mad at the folk who have not done something for us. And we go to hollering about all I've done for them and all I've helped them with. Be thankful that if God sees fit to bless you, it may not be where you sold it. But thank God you're reaping anyhow. Listen, many people that you bless may not ever bless you back. And, and you'll find yourself uneasy and you'll find yourself quite frustrated trying to get somebody to bless you because you didn't bless them. You just do what's right and let the Lord handle the rest. As we look in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21, the Bible tells us about this submitting uh, to one another and the fear of God. It starts in our family dynamic. Ephesians chapter 5 is teaching about the headship of Christ in the church, and, and he talks about husbands and wives, and, and it gets into this concept of mutual submission. But Ephesians 5, 21 says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. See, one of the problems that, that, that happens with people is everybody want to be in charge of somebody. And, and that's shown up a problem in the church now. I, I know I know that uh, Robbins doesn't have that kind of issue, but everywhere else, everybody wants to be in charge. And, and God doesn't need so many chiefs. God doesn't need so many people that want to run everything and want to run. See, we, we got too many folk in the church that's just got control issues. And, and everybody wants to boss somebody and, and want to be in charge. And, and folk get their jaws tight and poke their lips out when, when, when they can't get their way and their opinion was not validated. And I wasn't selected to lead the committee and... 
y'all didn't ask my opinion and all that kind of nonsense that gets in the way. What happened to submitting to one another? What happened to lowering ourselves? What, what happened to being selfless? What happened to me esteeming you better than self? Look, look in 1 John chapter 3. Look at the example of Jesus. Jesus, as God's son, had every right to assert authority. And he had every right to promote himself and elevate himself. He had every right to be in charge. But notice in 1 John 3 and verse 16, the Bible says, here's how we know the love of God. And this is mentioned as an example to us. It says, hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. Jesus, who had every right to exalt himself, he became obedient unto death. He humbled himself. That's what Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 2 is the humbling of Jesus. He laid down his life for us. And the Bible here says, and we ought. It's a whole lot of oughts. A lot of stuff we ought to do. Amen. A amen. We ought to live right. Amen. We don't always do it, but we ought to live right. We ought to give right. Amen. A whole lot of stuff we ought to do. We ought to lay down our lives for the brother. But what the Bible is saying in verse number 16 is there should never be a time that a loving Christian who understands the sacrifice of Jesus to be unwilling to reciprocate. That whatever we do, we should do it willingly for the benefit of other people. Now, now I have to throw a monkey wrench in here that's going to disturb some people. One of the things the Bible teaches is that we can't just love people that love us. And we can't just love people that we like. And so they're favorable to us, and we're going to be favorable to them. Real love is demonstrated when you got to love some folk that get on your last nerve. Amen. You, 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 got, you got to learn how to love some folk that make you want to pull out your piece and make some peace. I'm, I'm just trying to be real. See, 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 everybody ain't easy to love. And sometimes the hard to love people. I, I often ask my wife about the hard to unlove people. I say, do the hard to love people know they hard to love? <laughs> or do they just not care that they hard to love? It, it, it's sometimes, let's, let's be honest, it's sometimes that the hard to love people, if they are absent from service, you ain't exactly upset. <laughs> Now, you hope they okay. I mean, you, 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 you not wishing them to be dead. You, you know, you, you, you don't want them to be on a ventilator somewhere. But, but you ain't exactly missing the hard to love folk. You know, you, you, you know and some folk, I, you know, I, I say sometimes about people, they can be saved somewhere else. You know, they go somewhere else as long as they say, I'm fine if they somewhere else. Let, let, let's just be honest. See, when we sing about loving folk and read scripture about loving folk, we need to be honest. Everybody's not easy to love. But, but the Bible tells us that even the Gentiles have enough sense to love folk that love them back. Our love has to be greater 
and that we can say, I might disagree with you. You might get on my last nerve. I, I might have some tense moments and some uncomfortable times with you, but I'm going to love you because I can't fix my heart to hate who God loves. And if God loves you, who am I to overrule God? And I better hope God loves me while I'm sitting there determining whether you worth some love or not. And one of the things that we have to see about the ministry of seeking to love each other is the more we love each other, the less envious and jealous we are of each other. Y'all got quiet on me. In verse number 12, the Bible uses this analogy, this concept about Cain. 1 John 3 and verse 12. It says, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him because his own works was evil and his brother's righteous. I don't think people understand how deep this verse is. I think we, this is one of the verses we need to read it a hundred times and we need to read it slow. Because what this Bible verse is teaching us, 1 John 3 verse 12, are two important things that this verse is teaching us. Is that number one, when we look at the example of Cain, sometimes when we know when we're not right, we can't stand somebody else being right. When we know we ain't done what we're supposed to do, See, see, when you're living in darkness, you love being around dark people. Because, see, when we are in darkness together, there is no shame and guilt because we all doing the same thing. See, if we all getting drunk, ain't no problem. We all getting high. We all lying and cussing and gossiping and stealing and fornicating, committing adultery. When, when we all are sinning, we don't have a problem with each other. Because I know your dirt and you know mine. <laughs> you, you know, that, that, that's one of the things that, that irked me when folk go out of town and they visit another congregation. And they come back and they say, Brother Gibbs, they was just so loving. You know why they loved you so much? Because they don't know you. See, one of the things that get in the way with us is that we know too much about each other. Hey, hey, I think I've said something. Let me, let me, let me, let me move on. Let me, let me, let me help. The, the, the second thing here that this verse is teaching us, again, 1 John 3, verse number 12, when it talks about his works were evil and his brothers are righteous, is that it's hard to love folk that you're jealous of. See, if I love you, I can appreciate your gift. I can appreciate you shining. When, when I love you, I don't care that you're smarter than me. When I love you, I don't care that you can do something I can't do. Or if I can do it, you can do it better. Listen, when I, when I go to lectureships and church events, I listen to preachers and and there are some preachers that God has just gifted. And I mean, there's some guys that can, can preach in a way, they can interpret the text, they can speak and arouse the audience. And I'm sitting there, and I'm on the edge of my seat in excitement. I'm not upset that somebody can preach better than me. I'm not upset that somebody can shine better than me. Because when I love you, I can't be jealous of you. When I love you, I can't be upset that God has blessed you. And when I am secure in me, I recognize that if you outshine me, if you know what I don't know, if you can do what I can do, in me being secure within me, it actually makes me a better person to have you on my team. Amen. 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 Let, me, let me give it to you this way. We'll move on. I remember when I was kids and we would play baseball or basketball or something at recess in school. And, and, and at that time, when you know, you, 
we all the boys, we would stand around and we would pick our team. So like if you was playing basketball, you wanted the tall people. Like you didn't know if they could dribble or anything, but they was tall, you just assumed that they could play basketball. When we were playing baseball, we would look at guys' arms and we would say, oh, he, he, he's scrawny, right? You know, we, we, he can't hit, you know, his arm's too small. But we look at the boys with the big biceps and stuff and we say, he can hit, right? And we had sense enough as children to see people's gifts and put them on our team because even though we didn't have the gift, we got to shine because they was on our team. Right. Now, now, here's what I don't understand. If we got that sense as little boys on a playground, why as adults... Don't we have sense to put some strong people on our team? Why, why don't we have sense to put some sharp folk around us? Yeah. If, if you want to shine, you, you got to put some folk that's shining around you. But you can't be insecure and you cannot be so messed up within yourself that you keep aligning with folk like you because if you align with folk like you, all you're going to ever be is like you. Amen. I'm trying to teach us what real love looks like. Love is not only the ministry of seeking and submitting to each other, it's also about serving one another. When we talk about serving one another, again, we looked at the idea that Jesus laid down his life for the sheep. But then we have to learn that serving is doing it willingly. And the ministry of serving we ought to do it without being made. You, you ever just ask somebody to do something and you hate, you ask them because they're going to do it, but they let you know they don't want to do it? Yeah. Well, let me go on in here and cook dinner for you. Well, you know, you got that kind of attitude. Don't feed me. <laughs> you know, amen. I got an understanding with my wife. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't do any cooking, but I got understanding with my wife. If you upset with me for any reason, <laughs> until it's resolved, you can't cook my food. <laughs> because I'm not trying to be the subject of a lifetime television show. <laughs> Amen. Y'all know I got one of them quiet wives. Them quiet folk will kill you. <laughs> Uh, folks sometimes get attitudes about doing the right thing. Look at John chapter 10, if you will. I want to show you an attitude you should have about doing the right thing. John chapter 10, I want you to notice something. I want you to notice something. John chapter 10. See the kind of attitude we should have in doing for people. Starting in verse number 17. John chapter 10. I want everybody to see this. I don't want you all to say this is Conleyology. This is Bibleology. And John chapter 10 and verse 17. The Bible says, therefore does my father love me. And notice this next phrase, because I laid down my life that I might take it again. Notice verse 18. No man takes it from me but I lay it down of myself. Y'all see that? Amen. Jesus says, I'm willing to serve you, not out of coercion. I'm willing to do it because that's where my heart is. That's where my love is. No, no one's making me. No one's taking my life. He says, I do this willingly. Let me ask you, how many people are you willing to serve? Sometimes we get upset because of all of the things that have not been done for us. And one of the things that I try to share with people, and I don't mean this lightly uh, and certainly without uh, being insensitive, but sometimes our problems is that we have not emotionally healed from where we are broken in our lives. And so our concept is love, of love is skewed 
because sometimes as children, as young kids, as young adults early in our life, we have had experiences that have emotionally scarred us. And so we go through life with a handicap because we were teased as kids about something. It might be colorism, the color of our skin. It might be a birthmark on us. It, it may be something about us. It may be our height, our stature. If you was tall, you was awkward. If you was short, you was weak. And, and, and those things scarred us. Sometimes broken relationships with parents, with grandparents, with, with siblings, fighting in our families, being treated bad, being violated, not always physically, sometimes we've been violated mentally. Sometimes people have been physically molested, but some people have been mentally molested. Some people emotionally have been damaged. I have seen people who have been mistreated, folk who have been disregarded, I have seen things in people that suggest that somewhere in their life there is an emotional deficit. Mm -hmm. People have been abused in relationships. People have been mistreated by family members. Some years ago, I was talking with a person, and they shared with me some things that they gave me permission to share. I will not mention the name but shared with me about colorism in their family. And you go to family members, a family member's house and you see all the light-skinned people in the family hanging on the wall. None of the dark-skinned people in the family. It's pictures were on the wall. That messes with your psyche. That messes your head up. That's not physical molestation. That's mental and emotional abuse. There have been people, and we could go on and on and on with examples, and I'm hoping that even if we don't mention your specific example, that we are illustrating that sometimes we need to deal with where we are broken. Because what happens when we are broken is we come to church and we try to make people validate where we are broken. And we fall out with people because, for example, if someone in your personal life has made you feel irrelevant, you want everybody in the church to make you feel like you're somebody. If somebody in your personal life has, has taken advantage of you, you come to church and you want everybody in the church to uphold you. If someone in your personal life has dismissed you and your opinion didn't count, then you come to church and you want everybody in the church to listen to what you got to say. We have to be careful that if we're going to be a loving church in an unloving world, that we don't get in the way of God's mission and ministry of the church because we messed up. Too often we have people who can't seek the best interests of others and cannot serve because they are so busy trying to make it all about them. The regular is, I'm going to transfer my membership. They don't appreciate me. Move on. When, when people, see, see the problem with people is that you can keep running, but the person you're running from is yourself. And you can't outrun you. Amen. 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 There's three types of people in your life. There are those who strengthen you. And all of us can use some folk that strengthen us. There are those who stress you. There's a whole lot of them. And there are those who stand by and observe you. You have people who will strengthen you. You have people who will stress you. And you have people who will stand by and observe you. And you need to ask God to help you to align with some folk that can help you and you can help them so that you are never in the way of what God wants his church to be. The church needs to be the most loving 
organization, institution, business, whatever you want to call it, is really the body of Christ. But however you understand the church, whatever terminology meets your understanding, the church needs to be the greatest display of love. And often what happens is that everybody has a light, and sometimes our shade gets in the way of our light. I have a lamp on my nightstand, and when you turn it on, it gives a, a, a mild illumination in my room. But the lampshade is really thick. And if you take the lampshade off, that room just lights up. But when you put the lampshade back on it, it's just a mild illumination. And sometimes we have lampshades on our lights. God has given us all the light, but, but we have emotional baggage that makes up our lampshade. We've got some deficits in who we are. We've got some things in our past, some things in us, and it's keeping us from shining. And we are so insisting that people see our light and see our value and see what we got to offer and see how great we are and how wonderful we are. And we want those people to make up for how everybody else messed us up. But you got to take your shade off because your shade will mess your light up. Amen. Amen. Let, me, let me move on and close. Let me move on. We, as a loving church in an unloving world, we have this ministry of seeking each other, this ministry of serving each other. And then finally, quickly, we have the ministry of sharing with each other. As you look at this particular passage, 1 John chapter 3, if you look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 17, the Bible says, but whoso has this world's good and seeth his brother in need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? The Bible teaches that we have the ministry of sharing with one another. Let me, let me quickly give you four things that we could share. Because, see, I know we talk about sharing. First thing we say is money. Hey, don't let them get our attention like money. <laughs> let, me, let me quickly give, quickly give you four things that we can share with one another that can make a difference. Now, if you need to share money with somebody, share money. If you need to share what you have, share what you have. If you can bless somebody, there's nothing wrong with blessing somebody who needs a blessing. And one of the mistakes that we have in life is we give too much to the wrong people and too little to the right people. See, oftentimes we help folk that we ain't helping. And the folk that really need a help ain't the ones we give to. Y'all got quiet. Let me move on. Four things quickly, four things very quickly that we can share with people. And this will bless you in loving people. Number one, share time with people. Sometimes just taking some time. Pick up a phone. Invite somebody out for a cup of coffee. Taking time with people. I had a great experience recently with a person that I do business with, and I wrote a letter to compliment her, and I sent it to her boss. And her boss contacted me and said, Mr. Gibbs, people don't take time to write letters and send them in the mail. She said, we were so impressed that at our meeting, your letter was the subject of the meeting. Taking time assigns value. Second, be willing to share your space. Sometimes folks just don't want to be bothered with people. And some people have been social distancing before they knew what corona was. <laughs> some folk have been social distancing long before coronavirus was ever something we knew about. Because we don't want folks. Invite somebody to your home. And invite people to share your space. And here's what's interesting. Every time I've ever preached something like this, I get folk to tell me why they won't do that. And it's amazing how when they have a time in their life when they need somebody, 
they have not done. There's a concept in the business world. There's a concept called social equity. Social equity. That means you have to be able to build up enough social relations with people that when you need to go in the social equity bank, you can write a check and it won't bounce. People who spend their lives trying to convince folk they don't need folk are the ones who usually suffer the most when problems come. You need to have some social equity. Number three, you not only share time, share space, sometimes you need to share a tear with people. How many times have you cried with somebody? Now, now my fourth point, I want to tell you, and then we're going to come back to this tear. You need to share joy with people. But it's interesting, people love to share the highs. And the reason why people love to share highs is because they hope they can attach themselves to your success. So they don't mind being around you when you can pay the bill and when you got it going on and when you flying high because they want to attach themselves to you. But are you willing to be there with somebody when they're crying? Do you know that one of the most common responses from people who attempted suicide and failed in their attempt, said if one person had to just said they cared, if one person had to just said don't do it, if one person would have just reached out, the difference that would have been made, they would not have jumped off the bridge, they would not have consumed the bottle of medication, if one person had to just said I care. Sometimes we need to be able to just say, Lord, help me to weep with somebody. Help me to be there for them. Because we want to be a loving church in an unloving world. If the church does not show love, I don't know where. Congress show ain't going to show no love. Any level of government is in turmoil. They ain't going to show no love. The courts aren't going to show love. The business world is about making money. We live in a world full of hatred. Can God's people be in the ministry of seeking to love each other, seeking to submit to each other, seeking to serve, seeking to share? And when we do that, we can transform the world and we can demonstrate the power of Jesus. Somebody said, Brother Gibbs, that's so idealistic. That'll never happen. Then you don't know what happened at Calvary. When Jesus said, Father, forgive them, that was love. The fact that he even went to the cross, that was love. And he says, if I be lifted up, I would draw all men unto me. When he was at the cross, everything he said, everything he uttered, everything he endured, was because he was demonstrating God's love. As you pray, you may pray about your health. You may pray about your finances. You may pray about any aspect of your life. But make sure you pray and ask God to fill your heart with love so that we can be a loving church in an unloving and hate-filled world. May God bless you. May God keep you as we come together and sing the response song.